Hello. Hey, how you doing? Good. How about you? Patrick came wonderful. Just trying to find out where I am. Got some quick lunch and or dinner in between. Oh, you did? Good for you. I didn't. <laughs> I'm having brats uh, at about a half an hour or so. Okay, I got to figure out what I'm doing. We doing okay, guys? Yeah, I had a quick question on the notebook. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I would, if you can see, that's, that's the first one I pulled up. Uh, if you can hold on for one second, let me find the other one I have to do tonight. Okay, what do you got a question on, Dylan? Um, so I was looking at your uh, announcement and it said that this week's grade will rep replace previous grades. Yeah. So if I, I forgot one section on my conclusion will it replace all of my other grades yep yeah okay yep dylan um what i'm really interested in doing and uh, believe me did i tick off that many people that only two of you are here now what i really want you to do is i really want you to learn how to do a notebook okay if you can demonstrate to me that you can do a proper notebook you're going to get all the points for it i said that all along uh, now, the problem is I described how to do the notebook in our first Zoom meeting for the lab. Do you remember that? Yeah, I've gotten 100s on my notebooks. I just forgot to do the... You'll, yeah, you'll, it'll, it'll be replaced, Dylan. Uh, the problem is that first lab that I talked about it never got saved. So. Oh, I so it didn't get saved because remember I had a problem. Uh, that's why we're doing the Zoom meetings for the lab about a half an hour after the Zoom meetings for the lecture. It never copied it. It never, I was, I, it never recorded. Uh, if it did record it, uh, what happened was it uh, deleted it. I, I, I don't know what happened to it. Whatever happened to it, um, Basically, it got, it got deleted. I thought you all had the information. So, and, and the other problem was I didn't get a chance to look at the notebooks until recently. And then I realized that something had to be done. So uh, that's why I was going to talk about it tonight. But apparently there are only three of you interested. Anyway, we doing okay, guys? Um, yeah, I'm doing well. Uh, with the notebook, I forgot to put in the 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 section about the the chemicals. No, like, you don't uh, need to, Khalil. You don't need to do that section. Got it. Because the reason I make I make the uh, everybody do it when we're on a face to face because you're actually working with the chemicals. And when you're working with the chemicals, you really need to know what the hazards are. So it's like uh, the, the one I, I cited, I think the uh, chemical I, I just printed out is lead nitrate. Lead nitrate is nasty, nasty stuff. If you remember uh, the Flint, Michigan thing, where they had lead in the water, this is even worse than that because that lead in the water is metallic lead. This is lead that is soluble. So the lead literally goes right into your system. And my other, my HCC uh, laboratories, 
I uh, have one of the experiments uses lead nitrate and I had a pregnant woman that was taking the lab. So I had to tell her, don't touch this stuff. So that's what I want you guys to be aware of what the chemical hazards are. But in our present circumstances, we don't have to do them. Okay, Khalil? Okay. Uh, Fair thank Fair you. I just wanted to make sure. Fair enough. Okay. The, has everybody been through the, has everybody been through the uh, um, uh, notebook, what, you're, what I expect from a notebook? Have you been through that lecture? Yeah. Okay, you're gonna have to bear with me because I have to make a presentation for those that missed out on it, okay? So I'm sorry, but that's what I'm gonna do for the first, for the first five, 10 minutes. If you want to go out and go somewhere else, that's fine. I, I'll understand it. Uh, definitely speaking, uh, I would say at, 10, at 7.45, 7.45, I will definitely be starting the lecture on the um, standardization of a base, okay? But I got to get to that other thing and I gotta hopefully do it real quick and easy, all right? If you wanna go, it, basically, uh, it's, it's not gonna hurt you to go through this. So basically I have six sections, six sections for a laboratory notebook. Objective, chemical hazards. You do not have to do chemical hazards because you're not touching the chemicals. Uh, if I have you next semester in Chem 2 and we're face-to-face, -face, you will have to do chemical hazards. Then you have to do a procedures page, a procedures, uh, a data table, a separate section for calculations, and a conclusion. What do I want for the objective? And I'm going to tap dance here because... Somebody just got in here that uh, probably may not have been here before because I don't recognize them. Now, are you in here yet? Uh, yes, sir, I am. Okay. Now, have you been through the notebook? Uh, yeah, I went through the example that you um, put up once. I because I, I, what I did is I went through the syllabus, and the syllabus said to use the example that was in the syllabus, so I did that. So you use the one in the syllabus. That's different from the one I want, though. Yeah, I, I saw when you emailed us, I saw that it was a separate one and then I went and used that one. I was like, oh, that makes a lot more sense. Okay, so I, I'm sorry, you're gonna have to bear with me now. So I'm gonna go through this because those that don't have access to the Zoom meeting, I have to make a recording so they have access to this, okay? No worries, I mean, I'm, I'm just here to make sure I really understand it as well as I can. All right, guys, objective. Basically, it's just a simple declarative sentence on what you, what you intend to do. We just went through the empirical formula. If you remember for the empirical formula, what did you end up doing? Dylan, what did you end up doing with that lab? What did you end up determining? The empirical formula of CuCl2 and H2O. Simple enough. That's what you... That's what you sought out to do, and that's what you ended up doing. Uh, I have my objective for it, just written here, to determine the empirical formula of an unknown compound consisting of copper, chlorine, and water. That's all I want, one sentence. Literally speaking, if I'm going through your notebook, if I'm a, a person that wants to see if you have anything interesting to me, I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna look at your table of contents, I'm gonna see the titles, then once I see the titles, I'm going to go by each one that interests me, and I'm going to see if you indeed did what I wanted you to do. I get that from the objective. So that's the whole reason for writing an objective. Okay, chemical hazards. It's not as bad as it seems. What you're going to do is you're going to just hit the Google Type in SDS in the name of the chemical. Then hit return. Then what it's, it's going to give you a list of varying companies 
that have produced that chemical, each chemical, each, each chemical plant that produces a chemical has to produce an SDS. In the SDS, it stands for a safety data sheet. It gives an idea of how you're supposed to handle that chemical, what the hazards are. Uh, if you have a spill, what do you do? Those kinds, of, that kind of information. What I want from the chemical hazards are long-term and immediate hazards. Hand write them into your notebook. I don't want them cut and pasted. For example, I just did one of lead to nitrate. This is what came up. Okay, I can translate that. Can cause eye and skin irritation. Can cause lead poisoning. Can cause this big long thing, which is the inability of the blood to deliver oxygen. Can have toxic effects in blood forming organs. Those are the immediate hazards. Then when I went in, that is the long-term hazard. I just kind of summarized it. Can cause this big long thing, I've already defined it. Uh, affects reproduction, unborn fetuses, and affects infant, infant mental development. Bad stuff, horrible stuff. I want you to know it. I want you to make sure you're wearing gloves when you handle this stuff because it is such a bad agent. That's why I want the chemical hazards. You said we didn't need it for this semester. You, do not need, you don't need it for this semester. Okay. okay, you do not need chemical hazards for this semester. Now, the, if the objective is what you're doing, the procedures are how you're going to do it. Simple, step-by-step -step procedures. I, the procedures I want you to write should enable somebody who has no experience doing the experiment at least a good shot at replicating your results. Empirical formula, tell me if I'm wrong with all the, with these instructions. Wash and dry the crucible, weigh that crucible. You put a, approximately a gram of the copper chloride hydrate into the crucible and you recorded the exact mass. Gently heated it. In other words, you waved a flame from the Bunsen burner across the bottom of the crucible the crystal should turn from greenish to brown. Ensure that all the crystals are brown by using a stir rod to stir around the crystals. Place the lid on the crucible, allow the cool. When cool to the touch, take the lid off the crucible and weigh the sample exactly. Repeat steps four to six. If the masses agree to within 0.5, continue on. If not, repeat four to six until you get a consistent mass. Quantitatively transfer the brown crystals from the crucible to a 100 milliliter beaker. Rinse the beaker with two portions of water. Add the solution to the crystals in the beaker. Fill the beaker to the 20 milliliter mark. Your solution should be greenish blue. Take approximately 20 centimeters of an aluminum wire. Coil it loosely add it to the beaker, and note, never add the solution to the wire because it causes a violent reaction. Allow the reaction to proceed. Periodically, knock off the brown substance from the wire with a glass stir rod. When the solution is colorless, about 50 minutes, knock off all the brown copper from the wire into the solution. Add about six drops of HCl. Weigh a piece of filter paper and watch glass. Set up the vacuum filtration equipment. Place a filter paper in the Buchner funnel. Add about five milliliters of water, then vacuum. This is to seat the filter. Filter your copper solution through the vacuum filter. Let the vacuum continue for two minutes, then stop it. Add about five milliliters of denatured alcohol to your crystals. Let it sit for two minutes, then filter. Place the filter on a watch glass, put it in an oven for 120 degrees for 10 minutes. Allow it to cool, weigh the watch glass filter in copper, put it back in there for five minutes. Allow, the cool, allow it to cool, weigh the watch glass filter in copper. If the weight agrees to within 0.05, you're done. 
If not, repeat 16 and 17 until it does. Do you think, looking at these instructions, do you think you could now just do the experiment? Probably, is there, yeah. Is there sufficient yeah. detail in there to allow you to do that? Yeah, these are very clear instructions. So that's what I want you to do. You need to do this. It, believe it or not, it's going to help you because uh, I don't know what they plan to do for the final, but they may ask you to go through procedures in order to do something. As a matter of fact, if I had designed the final, that's one of the things I would have done. Data table. Okay, you're allowed, you're allowed. We have the data tables that are made in the lab manual. They're there. You're allowed to print a hard copy and put it into your notebook. It's got to be pasted, glued, taped, stapled. It has to be permanently in your notebook. If it's in loose leaf form, it does not count. Do you understand? Because when I get notebooks in the face-to-face -face classes, all the time I get people that don't permanently implant that table in there and they think it counts. It does not. Mainly I'm interested in your maintaining the correct measurement reactions, measurement readings and the significant figures. Don't put your calculations in your data page. You're going to be tempted to do that. What it does is it makes everything extremely messy and confusing. Use a separate section for your calculations. Your calculation section, one calculation, birth to death. If you do multiple trials, as we are doing next week, I only need to see one of the trials. It might be easier for you to include all the calculations. I don't care if you include one of them, but I must see one from the beginning of the, of the uh, experiment to the final determination. It all calculates, even if it's something as simple as an average or a calculation. The reason I wanna see averages uh, as a general rule, it's because I wanna see how precise you're doing. I wanna be able to see each individual trial to see that you are replicating your results. So that's why I want to see averages. Remember, if it was not measured, you calculated it, I want to see it. So if I was doing the empirical formula one, I would do the mass of the hydrate in crucible minus the mass of the crucible, I get the mass of the hydrate. I would take the number of the mass of the anhydrous in crucible, subtract the mass of the crucible, I have the mass of the anhydrous. Mass of the hydrate minus mass of the anhydrous is mass of water. Mass of copper, filter paper, and watch glass minus the mass of the filter paper and the watch glass, that's my mass of copper. Mass of anhydrous minus mass of copper, mass of chlorine. Mass of copper divided by the molecular weight, moles of copper, same thing with the chlorine, same thing with the water. Moles of chlorine, the moles of copper, that gives me the molar ratio. Moles of water, the moles of copper, that gives me the molar ratio. Questions about the calculations. Are you understanding what I'm talking about when I say from birth to death? Yeah, literally, like, you know, as long as you've got the first trials data there, everything, all the math that you're doing from the start of the experiment to the end of the experiment to show kind of like how you work through it. Yes. Again, if you do multiple trials, Next week, you are going to be doing, or actually tonight, from tonight for pending and next week, you are doing multiple trials. So you don't have to show all of them. It's a convenient place. You got to write it down somewhere, right? So if you write it down somewhere, you might as well write it in your notebook. Just a thought, okay? Now, the last section. First statement of your conclusion. What I want you to do is answer the objective. If the objective was determine the empirical formula, 
alpha A copper chlorine and water compound. For the conclusion, simple first statement, the empirical formula was. Then I want you to get into error analysis. I want you to state a possible error. Then after you've stated that error, I want you to analyze how it affected your result. Florida's humid. So after we heated the salt to drive off the water, and to, after we heated it to drive off the water, it absorbed water as it was cooling. Analysis, the anhydrous weight was larger than expected. Therefore, when I subtracted it from the hydrate, I got a lower. Let me, let me fix this. I got a lower mass for the water. I did this real quick. Sorry. Okay. All right. The lower mass of the water led to a smaller Okay, when I had a lower mass of water, I eventually turned that into moles of water, which would have meant I had less moles. And when I divided the less moles of water by the copper, that would have meant that my ratio was smaller. Again, the higher, the lower anhydrous weight would have let the effect of giving a smaller mass of, of chlorine and this would lead to a smaller ratio of chlorine to copper. Are you basically understanding what I'm wanting from a error analysis? Density. Okay. Some of the liquid spilled out before I got the volume. Human error. Yes. If some of the liquid spilled out before I got the volume, you're dividing by a smaller number than it should have been. Therefore, your density is going to be greater than it should be. Do we understand what I'm talking about by the analysis of your error? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. There are sometimes, sometimes you're going to be asked to give numerical analysis of uh, and, and numerical error analysis. Sometimes you're going to be given the real answer and then you're going to be asked to compare your answer to that real answer. Therefore, you do something that's called a percent error. Percent error is actual value minus expected value divided by expected value times 100%. Okay, something, something to the effect. Okay, I'll use this. The molar ratio you got between chlorine and copper was 2.10. The expected value is two because it's copper two. It's copper two. You expect two chlorines, so you expect the ratio to be exactly 2.0. The value I got, 2.1 minus 2.0 divided by 2 times 100, that is a 5% error. Questions, guys? The second thing we're going to talk about, sometimes, like in the next experiment, you're supposed to be titrate, you're, you're trying to determine what the concentration of base is in a solution. Is the concentration changing? No. You're using the same solution. The concentration shouldn't change. So you should be expecting to get the same answer each and every time. So I want you to tell me how precise you were. So what that means is you're going to add up all of your values and you are going to get an average of those, okay? 
then you are going to use the standard deviation formula. You're going to take your trial one value, subtract the average from it, and you're going to take the, oh God, I just lost my mind. What are the two lines called, guys? Oh, um, absolute value. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm just losing my mind here. You're going to take trial one minus the average absolute value of it, plus trial two minus the average absolute value, plus trial three minus the average absolute value. You're going to keep on doing that until you get to trial n minus the average absolute value. Then you are going to divide that by... the number of trials you did. All right, I did the empirical and formula experiment five times and I got five results, 2.03, 2.07, 2.25, 2.05, and 2.09. Is there one result that seems way out of line with the other results? Yeah, 2.25. Throw it out. Throw it out. If you're doing an experiment and one is out of, out of line, that is called an outlier and you can throw it away because of the fact that there is something that happened, something peculiar happened during that trial. Because something peculiar, ha what happened? Maybe you had a... Uh, Maybe that was the one that you let the water absorb in a little bit too much. Okay? It's, you can feel free to throw that result out. So I'm going to take the other four, get the average, which is 2.6. So I'm going to take 2.03 minus 2.06 plus 2.07 minus 2.06 plus 2.05 minus 2.06 plus 209 minus 206. Guys, if you do not do the absolute value, your answer is going to be zero. Because what you're doing is subtracting things that are below the average as well as things that are above the average. So if you do that just out of straight, you are going to get zero. That's why you have to do the absolute value. So the absolute values are 0 0.03 plus 0 0.01 plus 0 0.01 plus 0 0.03 divided by 4. That's 0 0.08 divided by 4. My answer is a plus or minus 0 0.02. What that means to you is that my final answer is 2.06 plus or minus 0 0.02. So what I'm doing is I'm giving you a range of what my answer is. The answer can be anywhere from 2.04 to 2.08. That's all I got on the notebook, guys. Any questions? Is this making a little more sense to you? Yeah, definitely. And the others are either not here. They've probably gone off to eat dinner. No, I'm here. Off? This this makes a lot of sense. I'm here. Okay. Guys, it's just one way of doing a notebook. This is my way of doing a notebook. Mm -hmm. If you have another professor next semester, you may have a completely different way, okay? Mm -hmm. The PowerPoint is loaded up. This Zoom lesson will be put onto the course. It may not happen until tomorrow, but it will be put there. So you have various sources. If you, if you talk to somebody in the forum, if you talk to somebody in the forum, tell them that the, these resources are out there. Again, I apologize for not having them available to you before this time. I thought I had done that. That's my only excuse. Now, let's get into... Let's get into the real thing we're doing tonight. And that is standardization of a base.
That's what we're doing. Guys, if you learn how to titrate, ladies and gentlemen, if you learn how to titrate, then you've got a job for life. Personally, if I had to do this for the rest of my life, I would be slitting my wrists. <laughs> I am horrible about titration. I used to have to titrate my secondary alcohol solutions for my, for my lab when I worked in forensics. I had to get six trials that agreed to within 5%. I would pipette 12 samples just to see that I would get six good ones. I am not good at this. There are, it's, it's a thing. You are gonna find people that have a knack. If you're OCD, you have a knack for doing this because you have an attention for detail. If you're like me, who doesn't give a damn too much about details, that's why I get myself in trouble. But if you can do this, you have a job for life. And why is this shutting down on me? Sorry guys, it just went away. Good. That's not good. No, I mean like you're good, I'm not like. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna go here again. Okay. Let me, I'm gonna end the show because I wanna make sure I get the slides. Okay. First thing you gotta know, moles are moles. It doesn't matter how you get them. Moles are moles. If you, take the weight that you have. You have grams of something, you divide it by your molecular weight, you get moles. If you have moles of a gas at STP, you can also get moles by dividing the liters of that gas at STP by 22.414. It doesn't matter. The moles you get by dividing by 22.414 are the same type of moles you get by dividing the molecular weight. You can also get them if you have the concentration in moles per liter and you have the volume. We're gonna be going over this on Thursday because on Thursday we're gonna to get to solution chemistry. Basically, if you have the, the concentration in molarity, molarity is moles per liter, and you have the volume, you can turn the volume in the liters, then multiply it by the concentration, that will give you moles. They're the same kind of moles. We good with that, guys? We have an understanding of that? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a universal unit. Universal unit. It doesn't matter which calculation you use to get moles, as long as you're in moles, those things are all, those things are all equal. Next thing I gotta tell you, is how to read a burette. A burette is a long, thin tube that has markings on it. At the very end of this tube is a stopcock. What you do with the stopcock is you turn it. This allows the liquid to drain from the tube. What a burette is designed to do is it's designed to tell you how much volume was delivered. So it's written backwards. If you notice the numbers, the numbers go down as you're going, oh, sorry, excuse me. The numbers go up as you are going down. Do you all see that? Mm -hmm. So you read a burette from the top down. So. I would read where the meniscus is here. I would read it at 40.05, not 41.95. Do you all understand that? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. All right. Second thing I know, need to know. The 
the amount of volume between here and here is one milliliter. There are 10 spaces. So if I divide that one milliliter by the 10 spaces, each line is worth 0.1 milliliters. So when you're reading a burette, you always estimate it to 0 0.01 milliliters. If you haven't written that down, do it now, because I want to ensure that you give me the correct measurement readings. I am not aware of any burette that's any finer than 0.1 milliliters. I'm sure there's some out there. 0 0.01 or 0.1? The lines, that mm -hmm. the lines are, each line reads 0.1 milliliters. Mm -hmm. So if the lines read 0.1 milliliter, remember mm -hmm. you can estimate one more digit out to the right. Okay. Got it. So if I, that's why when I read this, I read this as being the meniscus halfway between the main line of 40 and the first line there. So that was 40.05. Are we good with this, ladies and gentlemen? Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Catch me in about three hours after the fourth beer. We'll see if I'm still making sense. That's a joke, guys. I, I, I figured. I... <laughs> All right, thank you. I wasn't getting any response. I figure somebody's taking down notes and uh, going to present this to the dean, and I'm going to be all kinds of trouble soon. All right, we're doing acid-base titrations. That's what we are doing for this experiment. There are other types of titrations. Uh, for example, you can use potassium permanganate and you can determine how much iron is in a solution using potassium permanganate. But specifically, we're doing acid-base titrations. There are two assumptions you gotta make when you're doing this lab. When it's pink, it's neutral. And when it's neutral, your H plus equals your OH minus moles. You notice I did not say moles of acid and moles of base. It's moles of H plus are equal to moles of OH minus. Now pink, phenolphthalein is a compound that is known to act as an indicator. It reacts very bright Fuchsia, I have to use that name for this color because there's nothing as obnoxious as fuchsia, unless it's that uh, neon yellow that you get sometimes. This color is so bright that it just literally knocks your eyes out if your base is strong enough. It's a very purplish pink color. It's clear when it's acidic. So basically, when you get the color just at that level, when it's just between clear and just pink, then your moles of H plus equal your moles of OH minus. The reason I didn't say moles of acid and moles of base is basically an acid can deliver more than one H, a base can deliver more than one OH. Now, if I'm dealing with a simple case where I'm dealing with moles of sodium hydroxide and HCl, each of them deliver the OH on the sodium hydroxide delivers one OH, the acid delivers one H plus. If that is the case, you can simplify the formula. You can simplify the formula to be the molarity of the acid times the volume of the acid. If you do that, that's going to give you moles of the acid. Because it's one-on-one, -on -one, the stoichiometry here is one-to-one, -one, moles of acid is equal to moles of base. So what's going to happen is that's going to be equal to the molarity of the base times the volume of the base. Or molarity of the acid times the volume of the acid 
equal similarity of the base times the volume of the base. Again, you can only use this formula if the coefficient in front of the base is the same number as the coefficient in front of the acid. If they don't equal, then you got to do the stoichiometry. If my acid as a concentration of 1.20 molarity, and it's 45.50 milliliters. First thing I have to do is convert the 45.50 milliliters into liters by dividing by a thousand. Then I multiply that by the molarity, I get 0 0.0546 moles of sulfuric acid. Now I have to employ the stoichiometry. There are two moles of potassium hydroxide for every one of sulfuric acid. So I take the moles of sulfuric acid, multiply that by two over one. I now have my moles of, N of KOH. But that moles of KOH was contained in a volume of KOH. And if I divide the moles of KOH by the volume it was originally contained in, I get the concentration of my KOH. So I get 0.1092 moles of KOH. I divide it by the volume, which is 0 0.03050 liters. That gives me a concentration of my KOH of 3.58 molarity. Does this make sense, guys? We doing yes, okay? Yeah. Anybody have any questions about anything I've said so far? All right. Our acid in this experiment is KHP. That does not stand for potassium, hydrogen, phosphorus. That stands for potassium, hydrogen, phthalate. The molar mass of potassium, hydrogen, phthalate is 204.22 grams. What you're going to do in this experiment, or what has been done for you, is that between 0.2 and 0.3 grams of KHP was weighed out. It was weighed out exactly as far as the balance would go out. And all that KHP was quantitatively transferred into an Erlenmeyer flask. Basically, what I mean by that is generally you weigh things on weigh paper. So you carefully take the, fold the weigh paper, pour it into the Erlenmeyer flask, and then you take a water bottle and you spray out all the residue from the paper, make sure it quantitatively everything gets into the Erlenmeyer. Okay, that's the first thing you do. You've made your solution. Dissolve it, the rest of it in 50 milliliters of water. It doesn't matter how much water you use because you're not using the concentration to figure out the moles of KHP. You're using the, the exact weight you weighed, and you are using the molecular weight. Those two things will get you moles. All right, next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna condition your burettes with sodium hydroxide. Your burettes, never trust that a burette is clean, especially the ones in our laboratories. So what you do is you rinse it out with water a couple times. Now, if I put sodium hydroxide in that burette with those little drops of water, isn't that going to dilute my, my solution of sodium hydroxide more than in my stock solution? Absolutely, yeah. So what you do is you run sodium hydroxide through the burette three times. Put about 10 milliliters in at a time, run it through, put it in again, run it through, put it in a third time run it through. What this has done is effectively you have taken all the water out and replaced it with your stock solution. So now when you put that stock solution into the burette, you've got exactly the same concentration in the burette as is in your stock solution. What you need to do is you need to fill the burette above the 0.00, .00 line. 
Then you got to open the burette. The reason you're doing that is you want to make sure there are no air bubbles in the tip. Then you need to get the volume to 0, 0.00 milliliters or below. If it's above the 0, 0.00 line, you can't read it. You note the initial volume of the base. Now you take your KHP solution that is in the Erlenmeyer. You add one drop of phenolphthalein. You put that beneath the burette and you carefully add the NaOH until the solution turns pink. You note the final volume of the base. So KHP delivers one mole or one H plus, NaOH delivers one OH. So the stoichiometry is one to one. Let's say you measured out 0.253 grams of KHP. I need to know moles of KHP. So I divide that by the 204.22, the molecular weight of KHP. This gives me 0 0.00124 moles of KHP. Are you with me so far, guys? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, let's see what, yeah, all right. Now, I said there's one mole of NaOH for one mole of KHP. So if I have this many moles of KHP, I have the same amount of moles of NaOH. Now, if I started, if my initial volume reading was 0 0.05 milliliters of NaOH and it turned pink, when my final volume was at 10.15. Then the burette delivered 10.15 milliliters minus my starting point. It delivered 10.10 10 milliliters of NaOH. So what that means is that my 0 0.00124 moles of NaOH was in the 10.10 milliliters. To get the concentration, I just have to take the moles of my NOH, divide it by the volume in liters. That molarity ends up being 0.123. That is how you need to do this experiment. Any questions on the calculations? Okay, I'm just gonna see what's else here. Uh, the, the rest of this, I just go through another, uh, I go through another explanation of standard deviation. All right, now, ladies and gentlemen, let's talk significant figures. You guys did great. There was only, out of 21 people, I only had two submissions that made a calculation that was wrong. And the only silly thing they did was, instead of subtracting the copper from the anhydrous weight, they subtracted it from the crucible and anhydrous weight. That's the only thing. I found that these PowerPoints really work at getting you to know the calculation. You have a template to work. I'm, fa I'm fantastic about that. Now let's talk about your significant figures. Ladies and gentlemen, every weight last week went out to three places past the decimal. So all the weights went out to three places. We had three significant figures for everything. Every calculation you did last week should have had three significant figures in it. Believe, we, we made it. We cannot make it any easier than that for you. Yet, there was one instance I took 25 points away because of significant figure errors. You can't just divide and multiply these things and say, okay, I'm going to put one significant figure here and okay, the next step, I'm going to put three to make up for it. It doesn't work that way, guys. A lot, lots of points were taken away 
because you're not paying attention to significant figures. That is really the only thing I really took away from last week's experiment. So let's look at the calculations here. I had to get the calculations. I weighed out three significant figures. So how many significant figures are my moles going to be? Stereo, guys. Three significant figures. Three, three sig figs. Okay. I take my three significant figures of my moles. It's the same for the, for the NaOH. And I'm dividing it more than likely by four sig figs, but that could be three sig figs. In other, and, then it, and basically, it doesn't matter whether it's three or four. My moles are three sig figs. I'm dividing by three or four sig figs. How many significant figures is my molarity going to be? Three sig figs. Three. I can't make it any more plain than that, guys. Please pay attention this week to sig figs. Believe it or not, it takes me a lot longer to grade papers when there's something wrong than if everybody has the right answer. I love it when everybody has the right answer. I get through these things in about 15 minutes and I don't have to make comments. Anybody have anything? Anything more for us tonight? I move that the meeting be adjourned. Do I have a second? Seconded. Seconded. Oh, that was quick. <laughs> All right. All right, guys. Take care, and I will see you next Tuesday. Thank you, Professor. All right. Take Thank care. You. Have a great Thank evening. you. Have a good night. Have a good night, guys.